All right, everyone, get ready, because today we are diving headfirst into the wild world of Spanish grammatical gender. We're talking L versus La. And trust me, it gets way more nuanced than you might think. Oh, I believe it. We've got a stack of articles and research here. And just skimming through, I can already tell this deep dive is going to be a wild ride. Mm -hmm. So to set the stage, every noun in Spanish gets a gender. Objects, ideas, everything. It's a fundamental part of the language. Yeah. And that's something that often trips up English speakers because we're used to just slapping the in front of everything. Right. The this, the that. Simple. But Spanish makes you think about this masculine or feminine thing constantly. Exactly. It's like a whole different way of seeing the world, grammatically speaking. But just to be clear, we're talking grammatical categories here, not biological sex, although, well, that's a whole other conversation. Ooh, I sense some juicy linguistic drama coming up. But first, break it down for me. How does this gender thing actually work in sentences? Think about how adjectives have to agree with the noun's gender. Like, a tall boy would be un chico alto in Spanish. But for a tall girl, it becomes una chica alta. That O often signals masculine and O feminine. Ah, so the whole sentence has to be on the same page, gender-wise. I vaguely remember those grammar rules from high school Spanish. It's a core concept, and it really highlights this fascinating way that Spanish emphasizes agreement throughout the sentence. It definitely adds an extra layer of complexity. I'll give it that. Yeah. But okay, we've got masculine and feminine, just like biological sex. Well, not so fast. And this is where the research gets really interesting. Just because a noun is grammatically masculine or feminine doesn't mean it perfectly aligns with whether something is biologically male or female. Okay, so it's not as straightforward as it seems. Spill a tea. What kind of curveballs does Spanish grammar throw at us? Let's take pronouns, for instance. Did you know that Spanish has separate feminine plural pronouns? Like... Nosotras means we, but specifically for a group of women. Wait, seriously? So even in something as basic as we, there's this extra layer of gender distinction. You got it. And that's something you don't see in a lot of other Romance languages, even those that also have the masculine feminine system. It just goes to show even seemingly simple grammar rules can reveal a lot about a culture and its worldview. All right, my mind is officially blown. Who knew a little pronoun could hold so much cultural weight? But my notes here say that Spanish gets even wilder with categories like common gender and epicene gender. Those sound way more intense than just masculine or feminine. Okay, my brain is still trying to wrap itself around the idea that even a simple we can have these hidden layers of meaning in Spanish. But my notes say things get even more interesting with common gender nouns. What makes those so special? They sound like they're breaking all the rules. They definitely add a twist. With common gender nouns, the noun itself doesn't actually change form for masculine or feminine, but the grammatical gender can switch depending on who or what you're talking about. Wait, hold up. The word stays the same, but its gender can flip-flop. Now my head is spinning. What's an example of that? Okay, think about the word violinist. In English, it's just one word no matter what. But in Spanish, it becomes el violinista for a man and la violinista for a woman. Same word, different article, different grammatical gender. Wow, it's like Spanish is hiding a secret gender code within the articles. I'm starting to see how these subtle grammar choices really impact how you interpret things. In English, we just use the and call it a day. It's true. The way Spanish forces you to constantly think about masculine and feminine, even with these common gender nouns, it really highlights how these grammatical structures we take for granted actually shape how we see the world. Deep stuff. Yeah. Okay, common gender nouns, officially mind-blowing, but we can't forget about epicene gender. My notes mention something about animals, which, knowing Spanish, is bound to be interesting. You're on the right track. Epicene gender is when one grammatical gender in Spanish covers both sexes, and it often applies to animals. So no matter if it's a girl frog or a boy cat, it's always L or always LA, no in-between. You nailed it. Take the word for mouse. It's L raton always masculine, regardless of whether it's Mickey or Minnie Mouse. So no matter what, you'd say El Raton, but if you needed to be specific, you'd have to tack on an extra word like macho or hembra. Exactly. It's like the language defaults to a specific gender in these cases, even if it doesn't actually line up with the biological sex of the animal. It makes you wonder if this tendency to categorize, even when it's not necessary, is a very human thing. Right. Like maybe it says more about us and our need to ladle everything than it does about language itself. It's a fascinating thought. It really is. And it speaks to the bigger picture here. These little grammatical quirks can open up these huge philosophical questions like, 
Are we imposing our own need for order on the world? Or is it something more innate? It's something to ponder. It's mind-blowing, right? Like this idea that we might be hardwired to categorize everything, even when it comes to a mouse's gender. But speaking of gender, my notes say there's one last curveball in the world of Spanish grammar. We've talked about masculine, feminine. But what about a third option? Is there such a thing as a neuter in Spanish? Ah, you've hit on one of the most intriguing aspects of this whole topic. Spanish might seem obsessed with its masculine-feminine duo, but there are these little clues that hint at a neuter gender lurking in the shadows. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. A linguistic ghost story. Is that because Spanish used to have a neuter gender, like, way back in the day? You're thinking like a linguistic detective. Remember how we talked about Spanish evolving from Latin? Well, Latin had a full-blown neuter gender. And while it mostly faded away in modern Spanish, you can still see its fingerprints if you know where to look. All right, you've got to give me the evidence. What are these ghosts of neuter that are still hanging around in modern Spanish? Well, consider the pronoun elo. We translate it as it in English, mm -hmm. right? But unlike el for he and ella for she, which clearly point to a masculine or feminine noun, elo is totally chilling in this gender-neutral zone. So Elo is like the ultimate undercover agent of gender neutrality in Spanish because it's not tied to a specific gender. You got it. And it's not alone. Think about the words esto, this, and eso, that. They're pointing to something specific, but they don't care if it's masculine or feminine. They exist in this in-between space grammatically. Like they somehow escaped the whole gender labeling system. But if this neuter gender was more common in Latin, what happened? Why did Spanish mostly get rid of it? Language evolution is a wild ride. Over time, a lot of those distinct neuter forms from Latin either disappeared or they merged with the masculine forms. But a few brave souls, like Elo and Esto, they survived. They're like those vintage band t-shirts you find in the back of your closet suddenly cool again. So even though modern Spanish is all about masculine and feminine, these little neuter remnants give us this peek into its past. Exactly. And it reminds us that language is constantly changing. Who knows what the future holds? Maybe Elo will have its moment in the spotlight. But speaking of change, the research we have actually delves into how grammatical gender in Spanish is sparking some major debate these days. Oh yeah, it's not just about which words get El or La anymore, is it? This is about language and social values colliding. What are some of the big issues people are talking about? One of the main points of contention is this tradition of defaulting to the masculine plural when you're referring to a group of people, even if there's only one man in the mix. Like, you'd typically say los amigos for the friends, even if the group was one guy and ten women. Yeah, I can see how that would rub some people the wrong way. It's like the grammar isn't keeping up with the times. Are there other examples of this kind of thing? Absolutely. Another criticism is that certain shortened forms in Spanish, what we call apocope forms, are always masculine. Take al for the comes from a plus l which is the masculine v so critics argue that these ingrained structures subtly reinforce this idea of masculine as the default even in grammar wow it's like these tiny little words are actually carrying a lot of historical baggage and it makes sense that people are starting to question whether the language itself is perpetuating bias exactly and this has led to some calls for a more inclusive version of spanish some proposals involve using gender neutral plural endings like s instead of the traditional os or e as as. So instead of los amigos or las amigas, you would say les amigues. Les amigues. I kind of like the sound of that. It's definitely different, but I can see how it would feel more inclusive. So are we on the verge of a grammar revolution in the Spanish-speaking world? That's the million-dollar question. Language changes slowly, you know, and it's always going to reflect the people who speak it. But one thing's for sure. There's no easy answer, no one-size-fits-all solution. The beauty... And the challenge of language is that it's always a work in progress. You're so right. It's a good reminder that language is never neutral. It carries all this history, all these values, and all these ongoing debates about identity and how we want to see ourselves reflected in the language we use. Who knew that diving into the world of el and la would be such a deep dive? That's the power of language for you. We take grammar for granted, but it can open these amazing doors into history, culture, and even the future of how we communicate. So true. It's been an incredible journey exploring the twists and turns of Spanish grammatical gender. From those sneaky little neuter remnants to the debate over inclusive language, there's clearly always more to learn. So to our listeners, keep those Spanish grammar books close, keep asking those tough questions, and most importantly, keep that curiosity alive. 
Until next time, this has been your deep dive into the fascinating world of language.